We also know, of course, of the, the, the uh, travels around Wales of Gerald of Wales, Geralus Cambrensis. He tells stories of seeing beavers in the River Tyvee, but he also tells an amusing story of being led across the swamps and quicksands of the River Neath by a local uh, character who led them halfway and then ran off to the other side, <laughs> demanding more money. <laughs> Otherwise, they would be left there. Uh, as somebody from Bridgend, we'd say that Neath hasn't changed that much. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a story that exists in, in uh, Gerald's uh, travels across Wales. And we know, of course, the work of George Borrow in the, in the 1830s. You go, well, I'm, I'm George Borrow. I'm a, oh, George Borrow, of course, is known the way he is. He's a very good person. He's a very good person. He's a very good person. I'm in Vana i Sharad, Gida Bobana, Gi Weld, Gwaith Deer Maur, Gwaith Hayar Maur, and Gwaith Brickye, or then Aravdal. A bit nathe, a the Davarn, Theo, a Vinathe, Istelaur, a Grando, a Scursia, and Cabinet Theo, and Bobol Theo. Scursia, of course, the Giring Gamrag. A Vedroyale, I in group. A Troy Ungamrag, either no, a Gwaid Ungamrag, more Nesole, I Gluet, with an Gwaid. A Vedroyna Rond, a Trino I Duliva Mass, or Davan, or the Manhapisian Boroin, or Sais, and Gilly Diat Camrag, Ashara Camrag, Gadano. My Pentra Gutter Vaud now are in Ubrenaman, Pentra Van Hard and Vam, and the Nuclear Pentra in New Edward Lot, Er Sunny. I was telling the story that George Borrow, when he travelled across Wales in his, his book Wild Wales, he travelled to a village called Gutter Vaur in the Ammon Valley where he saw steelworks and he saw uh, brickworks and he sat in a local tavern. And while he was there, he listened to the conversation around him, conversations that were taking place in, in Welsh. And he had learned Welsh to travel around Wales. And he listened to the conversations around him and uh, he interjected into one of the conversations in Welsh, at which point the locals got so upset they tried to throw him out. Uh, that village is now called Brenaman. It's the village where my parents are from, and some would say perhaps it hasn't changed all that much in that time. But we also know, of course, of the great journeys undertaken by those who went originally on, on the Mimosa in 1865 to Patagonia. They, I think, were, went to Patagonia under the misapprehension that it was a, a place of wonderful fertility, a, a place where an easy living could be found. It's far from that. It's a place where a lot of hard work uh, needs to be put in to make the, uh, the land uh, productive. But we know, of course, that people travelled to uh, Patagonia. They went there to follow an ideal, the ideal being that they believed that the Welsh language would be dead in Wales by the end of the 19th century. And so they went to Patagonia and wanted to set up a part of the world where Welsh would be predominant. And so we find ourselves in a situation that today where you have people who are five generations on from those original settlers who are still able to speak or understand Welsh. It's a remarkable achievement. Mm. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world for any other language with the same number of speakers. If you go to Nova Scotia and Canada, at one time there were 200,000 Gaelic speakers there. Now, then, it's gone. But in Patagonia, you still find people who are able to understand Welsh and able to speak Welsh. And it's a tremendous tribute to the resilience of the people who went there, the resilience in the face of what nature could throw at them, and their resilience mm. in the face of what their Spanish-speaking compatriots uh, could influence them uh, as well. Uh, a remarkable story. But of course, we also know of the great travels undertaken by so many in, into Pennsylvania, into Scranton and wilkes barre into the Anthracite districts of the US, a journey that part of my family uh, took in the 1930s. So to this day, there are communities there. Bryn Mawr is a prime example, where there's a famous university, that owe their roots to Wales and the, the desire of Welsh people to travel to what they thought was a better future. Many Welsh people went to Australia as well. In Ballarat, in the gold mining district of, uh, of Australia, there is a, a mine called the Sons of Gwalia. There's another mine called the New Gwalia. And in Broken Hill, in New South Wales, in the coal mines there, there was one mine that was only worked by the Welsh. They wouldn't let anyone else in. So uh, I'm surprised, actually, they didn't actually start putting uh, religious uh, <laughs> barriers as well, and uh, barriers in terms of where people had come from. But it does show you that sometimes, even though we think that Wales is a small nation, which it is, and a nation that hasn't perhaps influenced the world in the way that the Irish have done. In fact, it's quite true to say that. But on the other hand, it isn't true to say that we've had no influence at all. We've seen what Welsh communities have done as they've travelled across the world. We've seen the influence that they've had and their, their tenacity in keeping alive a culture, a culture and a language, in the case of, uh, of Patagonia. 
And that's why this exhibition is so important, because sometimes we need to be reminded of what's been done by people as they travel across from Wales to other countries. But also, of course, it's important that we understand what's been written about Wales over the years, that we understand the way Wales is perceived from the outside, because we know that the way that a country is perceived from the outside can affect tourism, can affect investment in that country. And one of the things that annoyed me more than anything about the Ryder Cup was the rain. How many times did I say it won't rain? And it did. <laughs> 15 days of rain in 15 hours. Uh, it played to the prejudices of yeah. many in Fleet Street. Yeah. Uh, and you would swear that, that the rain occurred only in the Esk Valley and stopped at the Seven Bridge because it couldn't find the toll to cross the bridge over <laughs> into Bristol. It only works, of course, if you remember that the toll is paid coming in. But it does show how important perception can be and how in seeing how other people have seen us over, over the centuries, we can model ourselves and remake ourselves as a modern country, as a country proud of its history, proud of its language, proud of its culture, but also a country that doesn't live in the past, doesn't worry the carcass of an old song, as R.S. Thomas would have put it, but a country that uses that history and uses that culture to build of the future and to look forward. So it gives me great pleasure. I mean, bless him out if he he agor aradan gosva hin hino. Bless him out if he should come to ball with his three doma here with the weld aradan gosva hinan. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, to officially open uh, the exhibition this evening and to see so many people here who've come to see it for the first time. But once again, we see in the National Library an exhibition that reminds us of who we are, but also reminds the world of who we are and reminds us of the contribution <coughs> we've made to the world. Something that sometimes we forget. So enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm sure you'll find the exhibition very informative and very interesting. When Hauch Gwedil and Oswet, when Sue Bechin Findu with the Arthangos Vahinan and in Didorol Yaun. Adiochimaur, I'm Thor. Thank you very much for coming.